Now let's work on an example that's more directly applicable to you. Namely, let's look at what happens when you spend a bunch of money on a credit card with a really high interest rate. Uh, something that uh, almost everyone in this, uh, in this world will uh, make the mistake of doing at least once in their life. Uh, here's me trying to convince you not to do it before you get started. Okay. So let's say what happens to your money if you spend $1,000 on a credit card that charges 24% per annum. Okay. And again, uh, a big part of this class and of the learning in this class is, is you learning uh, uh, the terminology that is common and useful in finance. So that when you go out into the real world, uh, you, uh, you are not surprised or taken advantage of um, when, you, uh, when you don't know the lingo. Okay, so per annum here is legal term. It's Latin for year. All this means, and it's just something that's very, very commonly written in a contract, is 24% per year. Right. But we're only going to leave the charges on the account for five months. So we're going to pay it off after five months. Assume the interest rate is compounded monthly. Okay. So here we, uh, we run up into another common thing, which is that uh, the interest rate in the contract that's charged is, uh, that's listed is often the annual rate, even though the compounding occurs differently. And what that means is that here in this problem, right? remember here's our formula, future value is equal to the present value times one plus the interest rate raised to the n. And what we're running up against here in this contract is that we're given an annual rate, but told that the rate compounds monthly, which means that I here is not 24%. That is the annual rate. We need to figure out what the monthly rate is. Okay? And the monthly rate is calculated by dividing the annual rate by the number of months in a year. So we need to go from 24% per year to 2% per month. Right? And if we were looking for a daily rate, we would simply be dividing the annual rate by the number of days in a year or the number of quarters in a year if we wanted the quarterly rate. What we're doing is adjusting the given rate, what's often called the stated rate, and we'll talk about that in the lecture, uh, to the actual rate, the, uh, the compounded rate. And our n here needs to be in the, the compounding period, meaning the, the, the compounding period for the rate needs to be the same as the number of periods here. N is not the number of years, it's the number of periods. And so here, if we're gonna use a monthly rate, then we're gonna leave the money on the credit card for a number of months here, five months. Okay. And our present value is 1,000. So we can plug all this into our formula. Future value here, $1,000. One plus 0.02% per month for five months is equal to 11.0408. Okay. So after only five months, $1,000 earns $100 in interest on a credit card. And this is not an uncommon rate here, 24%, especially for a beginner credit card. Uh, you, you, I would not be surprised to see a rate in a contract that high. So just buy a new computer and leave it on your credit card without paying it off for five months and you'll owe an additional $100 on, on top of that. Okay. So let's make it worse. What happens if for whatever reason you can't pay it off for an entire year? Right. Well, if you can't pay it off for an entire year, you leave that $1,000 in the account right, for one year and we know the annual rate. So one plus 24% raised to the one is 12.40. Now, this is not the right way to do it. Right? And the reason why is because of the compounding interest that we talked about earlier. If, right, and this is an easy trap to fall in, but if I, uh, if I assume that just because we're leaving the money in the account for one year, I can jump up to the annual rate that's given in the contract and just calculate how long uh, that we left it in at the annual rate, uh, I would get 1240. But this ignores all the compounding interest that would occur for the 11 months in between that year. Remember, the, the interest is compounding every month. I'm being charged 2% interest every month. 
And if you go back to the first problem that we worked and you look at the effect of the interest on interest, you'll see that we're ignoring a potentially big amount of money, right? This is how we should do it, right? One plus 2% per month for 12 months. This will capture the effect of 12, 11 months of compound interest at 2% per month. And we get 12, 68, 24, right? Now, that's a $28 difference in a year, which might seem really small, but remember that this is relatively a small amount to begin with. When we're talking about the finance of corporations, we're talking about millions and billions of dollars. And in that case, a 3% difference, it can be you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars off in terms of what we're doing. Right? So we need to make sure that we are always using the correct compounding period and that we're always matching the compounding periods of our N and IY. We, want, we can't be converting back and forth. Okay? Now, let me show you an example of what happens if we compound daily. And this is actually uh, the way that cre most credit cards uh, calculate their interest. They, they compound an annual rate at a daily and a daily occurrence. So they compound their 24% uh, annual interest at 360 days a year, which would be 0.066% or 365 days a year, which would be 0.0658%. Okay. Now, of course, we all know that there's 365 days in a year, um, but way back when this kind of math and this kind of financial thinking was developed, uh, so several hundred years ago, uh, there weren't calculators that made all of this math easy for us. And 365 being an odd number was significantly harder to do the mental math required in some of the things that we're going to do later. And so to make everything easier on the financial calculators, which were just people using Abacus, uh, they used a 360 day year. Now that is less common these days, but it is still around the use of the 360 day year just because of historical convention and it just hasn't totally been phased out. Obviously now we have a calculator, it makes no difference to us whether we, when, if to use a 365 day year, it doesn't make it any harder. But you will see occasionally uh, this 360 day convention being used. Uh, and so I just want you to sort of have a little, you know, maybe just a little trigger in your mind from remembering this potentially if you ever see it and you'll know why. Okay. Uh, in this class, just assume that we'll use a 365 day year. If I want you to use something different, uh, I will be, uh, I will tell you to do something different. In general, I try to be very, very specific about the compounding periods and the requirements in the setup for every problem on the homework and on the exam. So it's not something that you should be concerned about in terms of misplacing it or forgetting it, okay? But what if we uh, are compounding daily? What's the difference here? So we'll leave our $1,000 in the account. We're gonna leave it in there for one year, but we're gonna compound daily. And here, just for fun, I'll use the 360 day year. So I will compound at a 0.066% rate for 360 days, and I'll get 1271.14. Right. Now, I want you to notice something else interesting here, which is that uh, notice the way that the amount of compounding or the, the amount of compound interest slows the more you have right, or decreases the more you compound. So notice that the jump between compounding one time in a year, which is this, we would compound annually at a 24% rate for one year, we'd, we'd, we'd owe 1240. If we compound monthly, so we increase the compounding periods by 11, we owe an additional $28, almost $30 in additional interest. So that, that's fairly significant. That's, that's a couple of percent of the total amount that we owe. Uh, so so that's, that's fairly significant increase. But if we go from 12 compounding periods to 360 compounding periods, we only owe an additional $3. Right? 
And if I went from 360 compounding periods to an infinite number of compounding periods, I'd only owe a few additional cents. I think it's like 12, 71, 17 or something like that. So the increase is even smaller. And what that means is that the, the more we uh, increase the compounding periods, the less benefit it has to us if we're earning the money and the less benefit it has to a bank if they're charging the money. And so we typically don't see consumer contracts being written with anything more than daily compounding rates because the value is not any more significant. But we'll talk about some examples later on in the class where you might see uh, corporate financial contracts written with what we call continuous compounding, which means they are compounded every instant. Uh, and that means an infinite number of compounding periods. Again, the benefit is not that significant. Uh, but it does sometimes occasionally make the math a little easier.